Now, everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a dog for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I'll bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Ah, uh, welcome. Hello! Where am I? I? I don't know where I am. You killed the witch of the East. She has sisters in the West, in the North. Follow the brick road to the Emerald City. The wizard is there. Can this wizard take me home? Uh, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani with the wizard himself, David Cohen. Oh, great to be here, Doug. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. This th- this weekend we have a special guest. What you just heard was a clip, if you didn't recognize it, from uh, a little bit of the intro to Emerald City, which is uh, the new NBC show that's premiered, uh, uh, from, see now, four weeks ago on NBC at Friday nights at 9 o'clock. We're excited about this series and have a... A, uh, a rather interesting guest for us, David Cohen. Let's hear who we have. We have David Schulner, who serves as the executive producer and writer on Emerald City. And uh, David's many other credits include other TV series like Once and Again, Desperate Housewives, Everwood, Kings, Tell Me You Love Me, and Do No Harm. And we're really excited to have David on the show. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great to, to have you, and I appreciate your time. Uh First and foremost, we all know, of course, the name Emerald City. We've heard that somewhere. If we rack our brains, we've seen a movie some people may have heard of called The Wizard of Oz. Uh, um, But now, so what's the connection between maybe the books, The Wizard of Oz movie that we're familiar with, and now something called Emerald City for those of us in listening that may not have seen it yet. There's only a few, but for those who haven't seen it yet. Sure. Um, and we've only aired um, a week ago. We, we premiered a week ago, actually. Um, so, and we um, we aired um, our second episode, our, our third episode, but our second night um, on uh, Friday the 13th, January 13th. You, there's still time to catch up, and uh, you haven't missed too much yet. So, you can go to the NBC uh, website or get the NBC app and um, catch up on those episodes. Yes, and and pull it up on demand. You can kind of binge it, which which I uh, suggest is is not a bad idea because there are uh, quite a number of new and interesting takes on these characters. So what we're saying is Emerald City is, a, I believe you'd say, is a new take or a different take on the original story, the first book, I think, of uh, L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz. Is that correct? Well, what we've done is we've taken, so Baum wrote 14 books based in Oz. Um, You know, and the second book uh, doesn't even have Dorothy in it. Um, The second book is strictly um, Jack Pumpkinhead and Mombi and Tip, and there's no Dorothy, Lion, Tin Man, Toto, anything. Um, So what we've done is we've taken all 14 books, um, taken all those characters, and kind of put them all together uh, in the same world. Um, And as opposed to telling the story chapter by chapter, uh, we kind of mix it all up. Uh, so what you're seeing when you watch Emerald City is a combination of 14 books, um, hundreds of characters from all those books, uh, all inhabiting the same world at the same time. And David, and, this is know, a very this is a very light and happy take on uh, <laughs> on the Wizard of Oz. Well, you know, we've been getting a lot of um, I guess I'll say flack for being so dark, um, but I think. One, we're you know we're telling an adult story. We're taking, sure. we're doing an, a contemporary adult version of these books, um, and when we're telling an adult story, I guess, you know, it's con- anything can be considered dark when you're comparing it to a children's book. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, Emerald, uh, the movie Wizard of Oz, which is only the first book. Uh, most people obviously remember the color and the songs um, and Judy Garland. But I think what they forget is uh, Wizard of Oz is usually rated as one of the top ten scariest movies of all time. <laughs> um, in those compilation lists, uh, between the Wicked Witch of the West, 
the the fighting fo- the trees that grab you, the flying monkeys, um, the scarecrow being picked apart by the crow, you know, by the monkeys, and you know, there's a lot of really terrifying things in Wizard of Oz. And you know, when I was a kid, I think that was my takeaway was actually how scary it was, and I think a lot of people forget that. That's true, because um, it, it's overcome sometimes with the whimsical songs and the, the presentation of the characters uh, in, in the way that Ray Bulger and, and all of them did. Just a little yeah. trivia there is going along the lines of what you just said. I had been researching this and, and found something interesting that back in the day in the 1939 when they were making this movie, the original movie, talk about being scary, the characters themselves, the Tin Man, uh, the Scarecrow, and uh, the lion could not eat in the cafeteria with everyone else at MGM because <laughs> uh, they were too scary and didn't feel that, that, believe it or not, that was what it was. And so they had to eat in their own trailers. Awesome. So um, that really is, uh, you know, this flesh back to that time and, that, and day, those were uh, characters that didn't, just themselves, of course, you mentioned all the other the wizards and the, and, the, and the witches and everything else. Did, did you have the same problem on, on the <laughs> set uh, for your show, David, or? <laughs> no, we didn't. Uh, no, our problem was the catering. That's it. No one, no one went. No one ate the food. That was scary <laughs> enough, right? Uh, <laughs> that was scary, yeah. And also, there's now there was there's we talk about that music, which kind of uh, lightened, I think, the original movie up. You do have yeah. a certainly have a a soundtrack here. There's uh, I'm not giving uh, maybe there. Let me, I don't want to give it away, but there there are some. At least there's one song I know that's a, a song from a very popular band down the line in the in the series that you'll hear. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, so, the songs and music does play a part, but it's not a musical, of course. Um, no. And, and that's important to acknowledge that this is, d- dives into interesting takes on, I guess you'd say, the possible backstories of these characters that really does make sense if you dive into this series and watch, really, what is the Scarecrow? Why Why is he you know, coming to life and all that? What is the cowardly line and what made him cowardly and so forth? Is that, Does that make sense? Did you kind of dive into that and look into these characters and peel them apart to try to get a, um, you know, a backstory that, uh, that sure. would be interesting? Absolutely. I mean, you know, in, in the children's books, obviously, Bomb doesn't go into the psychological ramifications of a lot of the characters. But, you know, it, it, in the book, the Tin Man, for instance, which is, uh, was in love with a woman and who uh, was in love with a woman who, uh, a wicked witch, not the Wicked Witch of the West, but another wicked witch, um, controlled. And every time the Tin Man would touch this woman he loved, the witch put a spell on him which made him chop off each of his limbs with his own axe. All right? This is the children's book. Right. <laughs> so so when people accuse us of being dark, I'm like, wait, go back to the Tin Man story. He self-mutilated himself with his wood-chopping axe and, you know. Yeah, I mean, so, Grimm's Fairy Tales do, do, does that. And, and all the, if you look at yeah. the Disneyization, if you will, of the Cinderella and all those stories, if you go to the original stories, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty dark. The Little Mermaid uh, actually dies in the end, and, and that becomes part of the sea again and, and dies and all that. So not, not to get too far astray, but yes, I mean, that, yeah, that is no, a good fairy point. Tales are, fairy tales are dark. Yeah, uh, and to teach a lesson to children, I guess you'd say. But now we're going to try to teach lessons, if that makes any sense, to adults. In a way, uh, through this story, um, the question is, uh, you mentioned uh, Frank Pumpkinhead and and some others. Are there some characters here that haven't revealed themselves as to actually who they are, uh, but may, if you go into another season or two? Well, I think we do. we, We pretty much reveal everyone in the first season. You know, you reveal, you find, Dorothy finds the Scarecrow, um, or our version of the Scarecrow in episode one. Um, people are going to see the Tin Man very soon. Um, and then we're going to meet the lion later on uh, down the Yellow Bridge And road. we'll meet you, just, well, I'm sorry, one more second, David. We'll meet you right after this commercial break, and we'll come on right back. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Something tore through the sky. There is talk of rebellion, of magic. There's no more magic in Oz. Find her. She doesn't come back to Emerald City. I want magic. Did you kill my sister? 
Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Ah, that's eerie. This is Douglas Viviani back on Everything Old is New Again with David Cohen. And we are with David Schulner, the one of the executive producers, writers of Emerald City, which uh, appears on your TV screen on uh, Friday nights at 9 on NBC and certainly can pull up on demand if you, you've missed a few uh, episodes. Feel free to dive into that. Uh, David, welcome back. Glad to have you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, talking about and diving into a discussion, a uh, continuing discussion of Emerald City, uh, we spoke about the L. Frank Baum novels a bit. Just wanted to see, uh, we were mentioning that you, there are some characters, a few, that you seem to have um, uh, developed yourself. Now, let's be clear, the Wizard of Oz novels are in the public domain, so you, you, <coughs> were, did, did that give you some avenue of freedom to, to take these characters and, and uh, do them? do with what you're doing with them how does that work yeah i mean we had you know, we had free reign of um of these books and obviously we give l frank Baum credit um in the show um and we want to do it's and it's not just cherry picking we want to do justice to the original intent of the book so a lot of people think we're being very topical by um having a character named tip um spoiler alert, uh, who at the end of the uh, two-hour premiere goes from being a boy um, and then she turns into a, he turns into a girl. Um, and, ha- and that's that character's journey through the rest of the season is trying to come to te- terms with this new gender identity. And a lot of people think that we're being topical or we're trying to be political or so, you know. But this is from book number two in, in, in L. Frank Baum's uh, Oz series. This is the character of Tip, who starts off as a boy and ends up a girl, and we are just taking this character from the book and and putting her in the world. So see, that's it's, it's not so inter- our it's, see, that's, it's not our agenda. It, this is this is straight from the book. Right. So interesting because uh, L. Frank Baum uh, was a very strong supporter of the uh, independent woman back in his day. And we're talking about 1901, 1899, thereabouts yeah. with the, when he was developing the, the first novel. Uh, and uh, his you know, mother-in-law was uh, was very big in, in the suffrage movement and so forth. So um, he one was... One of the most famous, yeah, one of the most famous uh, suffragettes. Yes, uh, so it was. It was, um, you know, very much on his mind, and and I, you can definitely say ahead of his time. I Absolutely. would also suggest that the, something you may be hearing is that this Dorothy character is not the sweet, innocent sixteen-year-old uh, uh, that's flo- frolicking and skips towing t- to the tulip, so to speak. Uh, this is a strong woman that is trying to resolve her own problems and or, or her problems herself um, as best she can, as opposed to in the movie, they kind of sanitize it. I think you could say that these other characters helped, if not did, solve her problems for her. Uh, does that make sense? It looks like a di- different turn there. I don't know. I always thought, you know, Dorothy was the one who, uh, look, I the movie is owned by, we're not doing the movie, um, because the movie is not public domain, you know. Right. Uh, and the book is um, the book is actually Silver Slippers, uh, but the movie was like, well, we're doing Technicolor here. Let's make them Ruby Slippers, you know. So you're not going to see Ruby Slippers in our show because that's not the book. Um, but going back to your point, I, I always thought Dorothy was super strong in the movie. Uh, if you remember, she's the one who went up to the lion and I think like punched him in the face or bopped him on the nose or right. something. Um, so. I always thought Dorothy was this really strong character, um, and the only thing we're doing is uh, fleshing out um, the moments and giving characters time to really. What would ha- what, how would you feel if you were transported to a magical world and everything you knew and loved was gone in an instant? Um, most of us might not be as positive as Judy Garland's character was in the movie right? or optimistic as Dorothy was in the books. So we're just going for, you know, honestly, just a more realistic adult uh, adult spin on this. Um, so we're not trying to be edgy or, or, or dark. We're just trying to make it more realistic. 
Okay, and 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 that's uh, what kind of the world we're living in now. We see a lot of that in our entertainment now, and uh, obviously is attractive to people to revisit and see these characters that we think we know. But if you read, right. uh, you know, if you read these novels, uh, you really, you know, there was a certain interpretation back then, and now this is a, a, what we're trying to say here. I think is it's a, maybe a little more faithful interpretation of the original uh, intent uh, of the stories. No. I would hope so. I mean, in the in the second book, um, an army. The whole besides being about Tip and Mombi, this woman, this boy who wakes up a girl. The other plot line is about all the women, all the young girls of Oz, uh, become an army and march on Emerald City because they're tired of being ruled by men, and their goal is to dethrone the king and put a queen on the throne. And this, it, is the, this is a, this is the second book of the series in 1902. Or 1903, um, you know, we I, I, we couldn't make this up. <laughs> right, and, and there were some deficiencies back in the day. I mean, uh, with men, I guess is what we're trying to say was we all have issues. But back in in that day, uh, there's there are theories that if you take a look at the three characters, uh, the main male characters, they have their own deficiencies that uh, uh, you know that kind of there isn't there are themes that 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 presents sure. a problem uh, and that's what abound was trying to say is the for the men inside you you have these uh, the courage and you have a heart uh you right. recognize it and become and fulfill that uh, hopefully male the male species has done that this day but who knows um <laughs> and well the most efficient character of them all was the wizard right Exactly, and it was a big fraud, or was he? You know, that's the issue. Um, we we certainly uh, can de debate that. There's another theological or philosophical discussion I want to have with you, but first I want to play this one clip from uh, a show we always do a little bit of a Star Trek reference uh, uh, from Captain Picard here. Tune in. This is one of those times when we must face the ramifications of the Prime Directive. And uh, that's uh, referencing a prime directive in Star Trek, if you're not a fan or what have you. The bottom line is when they go out and meet new cultures, um, the, the people in Star Trek are and the crew are uh, restricted from interfering yes. with the development of an existing society if it doesn't or hasn't reached a certain level of maturity. Now, if we look right. at this story and we see when the wizard has come to, uh, you know, to this location and Dorothy, you know, from a different plane, a different existence, a different world, so to speak. And I'm not going to give anything away. I just want to ask the question, though, when yeah. that happens, um, does the wizard and or Dorothy affect the natural development of this world of, let's call it Oz, and and in turn, is that fair? And is that, you think, what's happening? Did they violate the Prime Directive and cause problems here? I think 100%. I think it, happen, you know, it happens in the books um, where the wizard, uh, you know, eventually in the books, um, the character of Tip outlaws magic because people have abused it um, and it and it's creating chaos um, and it's um, so I we took that idea of magic creating chaos and uh, running rampant and we gave that idea to the wizard um, so he comes in and he outlaws magic uh, as a way to uh, for him to gain in status and for him to be, remain unchallenged but what he ends up doing is creating an underground kind of rebellion against him, um, which will be led by Glenda. All right, we'll be back on Everything Old is New again to develop, develop that theory a little bit further. And uh, welcome back to uh, David Schuller on Everything Old is New again. And you can stop it. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. We're looking for a girl and her dog. Nothing good comes from the sky. So when it does, we send it back in pieces. There's only one person I fight for since the moment we met. War is a... 
Welcome to Douglas. Uh, well, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani. That kind of messed me up there. That clip was from um, uh, the uh, new series on NBC, Friday nights, 9 o'clock, Emerald City. And we are exec- happy to have the executive producer, writer, David Schulner, the sorcerer supreme, if you will, of uh, all things Emerald City at this point. Uh, David, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have a quick question in terms of uh, your participation in the show now you are an executive producer and writer with some others um what's just let's just explore a little bit of what you're doing specifically on the show itself sure so um me and sean cassidy are kind of the showrunners of the show um and we have three other writers we have um, a phenomenal writer named tracy belomo who uh has been with us on our staff and then we did two freelance episodes which um, used to be the rule of the day back in TV um, in the 50s and uh, 60s. But it's kind of grown out of fashion, and we kind of brought it back a little bit. So what that means is we brought in writers for, their, for one episode and then sent them away to write their episode and then work with them um, on that one episode as opposed to an ongoing weekly basis like Tracy, me, and Sean uh, do uh, week to week. Um, and we brought in an amazing comic book writer named Kelly Sudeconic, um, if you haven't heard of her, check out her comic books on Image and Marvel. Uh, and then a phenomenal playwright named Naomi Izuka, uh, who teaches playwriting at UCSD. Uh, so we brought these two writers in to kind of collaborate with us. And does that, what does that do with regard to the process? Do you think that brings some, I don't know, a fresh look, some fresh blood into the, uh, uh, a fresh memory, a energy into the process? Or why would you do that? Absolutely. I think, you know, very easily you can start drinking your own Kool-Aid, and, and, and it's really great to ha- bring people in with a completely fresh perspective. Uh, and even though they were only responsible for one episode, they were able to look at where we were going and where we'd come from and kind of have ideas and thoughts um, that would help us kind of shed a little new light on stuff that we may have missed or shortchanged. Uh, so it's just, it's just great to bring in some fresh, fresh blood. And just taking a look at your story a little bit, um, maybe you could just give us a little idea, because if you look at your career, it goes back all the way back to, to I should say all the way back, but, you know, Desperate Housewives, you were a writer on, and uh, uh, quite a number of shows you developed and, and were executive producer and writer on. How, how did you get into this business? What was the path you took? Because there's no real uh, known path to it, if that makes any sense. You don't just go to college, no, yeah, graduate, and become it. what you're doing. So how'd you do it? <laughs> I was a playwright. I started writing. You know, I was um, I was lucky enough to go to the, these great um, performing arts schools in Miami, uh, Florida, where I grew up. And I always thought I was wanted to be an actor. And our acting teacher came in and she said, "I'm really sorry. There's been a horrible mistake. I'm not an acting teacher. I'm a playwriting teacher. And uh, they can't. They they made a mistake and they hired hired me to teach your class. So I'm not going to teach you acting. I'm going to teach you playwriting. And maybe that'll make you better actors." So by accident, I took a playwriting class when I was 16 and realized I wanted to be a playwright. And so I started writing plays, and um, that led to uh, Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskovitz, who created 30-something and um, my so-called life. They read a play of mine, and they asked me to come write for their show once and again. Um, and that was about 15 years ago. Wow. And how did they get to this uh, this play that you, or, or a couple of plays <laughs> that you wrote? I mean, was that just a submission to everybody on the planet or what? No. Well, here's how you do it. You go on a blind date with a writer <laughs> from Dawson's Creek, and uh, then you have a, a TV career. That's what um, I've been telling you, Doug. Yeah, I've been telling you to go on a blind date <laughs> with someone from Dawson's Creek. You won't listen to me, though. There you go. Very specific. It's, it's a very specific path. Um and then we traded plays, and she was a playwright, too, and we traded plays, and she gave my play to her agent. Now, you say you grew up, in, and this was in Miami or in Florida. The, the, the date itself, did you bring yourself to California first, or did you date her? I did. Sarah? I, I did. I, um, I had a theater company in Minneapolis for four years, um, and as someone who was born and raised in Miami, four years in Minneapolis uh, was about enough <laughs> for me. Uh, so I quickly moved to California, um, and was writing plays for South Coast Rep in Costa Mesa. Uh, so I didn't even live in Los Angeles, actually. I lived um, in Long Beach, and I worked in Costa Mesa. Um, but then you get set up on a blind date with someone who writes for Dawson's Creek, and, and there's your career path. 
All right, so we got to think about who I can date these days. To how long? Get, how long did that last, life. by the way, David? <laughs> uh, I married her best friend. If nope. that is any indication. I guess it went pretty well then. It went pretty good. Yeah. I, I wonder, did you use any of that experience to develop uh, any storylines in *Desperate Housewives* or anywhere else? I mean, that sounds like a story unto itself, right there. How that <laughs> happened? But I guess that's no, a too, day. too tame for. Too tame for Desperate Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> right. A story for another day, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah. The G version is is, uh, is quite interesting, and we're talking with the executive producer, writer David Schulner from Emerald City Friday nights at 9 o'clock on NBC. I find it interesting that uh, when we're talking about this show, if you did not hear this interview and just went into this show blind, uh, you know, we have, like it or not, the impression of Wizard of Oz. I don't know that many people have read even synopses of uh, the right. original 17 novels by... 14. Uh, well, uh, there are a few that were published after he died, too, right? And then yeah, there was yes, a whole right. series after that, even. So uh, everything yeah. at Old is New Again ourselves, we're going to go uh, through the power of radio <laughs> next show, and we're going to go back to, to Oz uh, 78 years later and meet some of these characters ourselves. So um, you may want to tune into that next week. But... Uh, uh, along those lines, um, I think it's interesting if you take a look at the show and, and and with an open mind and put aside your experience with the old movie and just take it front with a blank slate with some characters that you're familiar with but may not know the entire story. It's sort of like being in high school or college and knowing people in the hallway and having an impression of them but not really talking to them. But when you sit them down for a few minutes and talk to them, it opens up a much more colorful uh, kaleidoscope of who they are. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, and I and you know what we haven't we we haven't talked about yet is um, Tarsem, our director, yes, uh, who who brings just a complete otherworldly beauty to to every scene he shoots, and I I'd be rem Sean and I would both be remiss if we didn't include him in like our little triumvirate because he took what we had on the page and he he completely reimagined and made it better. And uh, Tarsem directed all 10 of our episodes. And, and if you look at the, what he developed, there's no uh, view of the world of Oz like this. It's 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 not just painted on backgrounds. You know, this is a real expansive view uh, of of this world, and I think it's it's real fun to to look at down the alleys of Oz and and see what the people are doing for a living, or uh, what are these monkeys <laughs> really made of, and what's the purpose of these monkeys for real? Um, monkeys in quotes, right? And uh, so. I think, yeah, he did a great job. And I think now was that on, had to be on purpose to have, because many shows have many directors, to have one director yes. present the entire uh, first 10 episodes. Um, what, were you, what was your thinking on that? You wanted some consistency or what? Well, you know, it wasn't, we were just looking for a pilot director, and Tarsem was the one who came and said, uh, I have no interest in directing one show. And then he said, <laughs> he said it'd be like someone sleeping with my wife. He said, uh, <laughs> Why would I want to do all the hard work of creating this world, finding the locations, um, working with the set designer and the costume designer and the prop master, doing all the hard work and then giving the fun part, which is shooting, to somebody else? Hmm. So he said, the only way I'll do it is if I can do all ten. And I was thrilled. I was like, oh, thank God. This is going to make my, job, my life so much easier. Um, and it's going to give the show this great consistency. But it's just not how it's done in TV. But you can also see uh, his enthusiasm for the show. And uh, we'll oh, get back yeah. in, in a moment, uh, just cutting for a, a break here. We'll come on back and everything old is new again. Continue talking Emerald City with David Schulner. Friday nights at 9, NBC. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. I woke up in a place I don't belong. Have you asked yourself why you were brought to Oz? Are you just a girl from Kansas? Or are you more? There's a darkness here. Something wicked. And you can stop it. Yeah, definitely not Kansas. Welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani with the uh, Sorcerer Supreme, uh, uh, David Schulner, executive producer and writer of Emerald City, which you can tune into on Friday nights at 9 o'clock on NBC. Of course, we're here with David Cohen as well, and we're having uh, a 
pretty interesting discussion about this new series, Emerald City, which is a 10-episode se- ten series at this point, David. Uh, uh, are there any plans, do you think, for anything in the future with this? I mean, it sounds like there's quite a bit of material if you felt like yeah. uh, doing more. Yeah, we got 14 books. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If, uh, if if people watch it, if people like it, then um, we'll be back next year. And and if we have anything to say or do about that, we we, we would join in on that and say, uh, uh, you know, take a listen and, and a watch to this show. And um, and even you know, if you've missed any at this point, you can go to on demand and NBC and and pick that up. It's uh, it it almost it, it to me. You could watch it once and go through it, and that's fine. But there's a lot of levels of things that are going on as the show develops over time that if I, I kind of binged it, I had the privilege of, of being able to do that. So for me, I was able to catch some things, and I actually went back and, and watched a few parts of different episodes to piece some things together that are happening and if you're watching a show that's uh, like this when you've got a week in between every episode um i would suggest it might not be a bad idea to go back on demand to just revisit uh, the show again uh before the newest episode uh, am i wrong i mean as, especially as it develops there's there's a lot of themes and into intermixing of uh of uh, would you say motivations between different characters that eventually comes to a, a climax at the end absolutely i mean i think you know especially in this day, day and age of live tweeting the show, which um, we've been doing, uh, I, I, I can't imagine what Tartem would think. Uh, you know, people looking away from the screen for a second even just to tweet something about the show or good, bad, whatever, but you take your eye off the screen for a second and you might miss just uh, an, an amazing, something you've never seen before on screen because of Tartem. Uh so that's one reason I would rewatch the show. Um, I mean, I've seen each episode hundreds of times in the editing room, but uh, sometimes I make connections uh, from the just things that Tarson's done that I see for the first time. And this is after hundreds of rewatching, even being on set, and I'm just I'm just floored by the visual beauty of the show, um, which I had nothing to do with. But as a, f- I, I can actually be a fan of, of, of the show because of what Tarsem did. And then, like you said, on a character level, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things going on, especially because of the backstory with the wizard and the witches. Look, I hate exposition. I hate writing it. I hate watching it. So there's not a lot of exposition. You're kind of just dropped into this world like Dorothy, like Dorothy is. Um, so definitely, if you go back and rewatch it, you'll pick up bits and pieces of conversation between the wizard and the witches that reveal the history of Oz a little bit more. And David, speaking of which, so tell us a little bit about how you became involved with this project from the beginning. Sure, this has been a why. I mean, this, this show is probably greenlit, I, I would say, or, or or put in development about four years ago. Huh. Um, someone named Matthew Arnold um, had this great idea about putting all the characters in the book together uh, for the first time. And with that version that was picked up the series um a friend of mine named josh friedman came on to rewrite that script and become the showrunner for the show um i became josh hired me to be one of the writers for the show and we worked for about four months before nbc and josh kind of couldn't come to a tonal agreement on the show couldn't really crack what it what it was what it wanted to be Mm. Um, so then the project died. And then about six months later, uh, NBC asked me to, to resurrect it, to, to come on board. And, and, and then since I, I saw what happened between Josh and NBC, I kind of knew where the bodies were buried. I knew what NBC wanted, and I knew what Josh wanted, and I felt like I could, I could uh, bridge the gap. Uh, so to speak. And, and did you have help at the time when they asked you to sort of re- re-engineer it? No, I mean, I, I quickly took a stab at it just to see if I could do it, just to see if what I wanted to do would be okay with NBC as well. I didn't want to go down the same road Josh did. So I I kind of made a few adjustments, and I repitched the show to NBC. And then as soon as they said yes, um, I brought in Sean Cassidy uh, to, to run the show with me because I knew what a huge, huge undertaking the show would be. Hmm. Now, uh 
just taking a look at uh, this show, talking about everything old is new again, I think uh, yeah. this topic is is something that we're running uh, across, uh, and it's the reason why we developed the show, is that in entertainment, in the, in the world in general, but in, in pop culture and entertainment, uh, lots of our current entertainment relies upon the history and the foundation of shows and projects before. Doesn't mean it, and this is a great example, is a re- repeat or a copying or uh, you know or, or of anything in the past. This is a reimagining, um, and maybe as we said, a more uh, thoughtful uh, respect, a more thoughtful presentation of the original story that are in the book. So, uh, I don't know, do you think that uh, uh, this is ripe for everything old is new again in terms of uh, that topic? I mean, uh, we're we're on the, the same wavelength, I guess we could say, with the radio show here and, and what you're doing, I guess, no? A hundred percent. I mean, well, I mean, what's great about your show and what's great about the topic that you guys tackle is, uh, I don't know, it, it was always thus. If you look at Shakespeare's plays, Shakespeare's plays were always based on someone else's plays or based on someone else. I mean, everything old is new again is not new. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, in the, in, the best, in the best meaning of that, uh, every, there, there are no new stories. 